there's got to be more. What will it be? I want to go to that city he saw. stand up this time we're gonna sing another song oh i love you with the love of the lord song okay how's it go oh yeah right. y'all start up i love you with the love of the lord shake a hand hug it i love you with the Yeah. 
another breather. Okay, hey, let's go ahead and pray and let our pastor get up here a few moments and uh, see what he has for us. Well, Lord, thank you once again today for uh, one more time allowing us to come and just talk to you and pray right now, Lord, that you just take all these folks today, that you'll bless them in such a mighty way. And our pastor, as he stands here, that you'll lift him up, give him every word that he needs, Lord, to tell us the things that we need to hear. So, as we always say, Lord, we can go out tomorrow, today, and somewhere, Lord, and just help somebody else with what we've heard. So thank you for doing that. Pray for those folks on our prayer list. You know who they are. And tell you right now, Lord, that we love you. And ask you if you would, please, now, go with us, lead us, and guide us, because we do ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Well, it's good to have you back in the house of the Lord with us. How many are glad that you woke up, you got up, and you're still up? Amen. Hallelujah. Boy, I'm telling you what, all three of you were happy. Oh. If you're visiting with us today, let us say thank you for being with us. We're enjoying you, and if I haven't had a chance to meet you and shake hands with you, then uh, I apologize. And if someone else hasn't spoken to you, if you are a visitor, I apologize for the church. Sometimes we get caught up in our own little world, and we kind of forget those that are around us. But we want to welcome you. If you are visiting with us, we'd like to get you to fill out a visitor's card, if you would, for us. And then when you exit the building, the offering plates will be out in the vestibule. Just take that completed card and drop it off. We do cherish your information and we protect it. It doesn't leave the building. No information goes out of here uh, except with us. So we know how to pray for you. If you have a special need, be sure you'd like to list it on there. Uh, be sure to do that. And keep the pen. The pen's a gift of the church. That way you know how to get a hold of us. It has our number. But if you're visiting with us, would you slip your hand up? Let us give you a visitor's card and... And uh, we'll be glad to get a young, young man down here. And you're not a visitor, you're a home folks. Anyone else visiting with us down here? All right, if there's no one else, then we want to appreciate you being here. And uh, I know it's so... When you're visiting a church, you never know what to expect. Right? Well, I've got news for you. Those that have been coming here for 20 years still don't know what to expect. So we just kind of go by however God leads us and we'll see what... See what happens. Sometimes I, we do things that we can't blame on God. But anyway, we, uh, we're glad that we're... This is where we come and hope you'll come to enjoy the Lord, to worship Him. And uh, I, different people go different places to have what they call fun. This is my fun place. I, I hope that this will be a place for you that you can feel at home. And by the way, usually people come into church and they say, Oh, do you see what she's got on? Yeah, clothes. Get over it. Let's get that over with. I mean, we don't care. We're just glad you're here, and uh, you're here, and you're better to celebrate the Lord with us. Let's don't forget, this coming Sunday is what? Boy, y'all were slow on that one. This coming Sunday is what? Don't forget, if you happen to have a mother or a grandmother who is no longer with us, our tables will be set up on the side. You can bring, a, if you'd like to bring a, a photo of them. So in memory of them, we'd be more than happy to place them here on, our, on the table on the right-hand side as you come in. So we will, and be sure to do that. And we're going to celebrate the fact, one of the things that I know for a fact, since I don't have my mother anymore, um, you'll never know how much your mother or your father means until you don't have them. So let's celebrate them. If your parents are still alive, or your mother especially this day, then make sure, do a special, make a special effort. Uh, you know, one thing, the reason I love Mother's Day, Father's Day ain't a big deal to me. You know why? Most Father's Day, the parents will say to their dad, or the children will say to their dad, Dad, what do you want to do? What do you want us to do with you? Well, let's go fishing that Sunday, you know, or let's go hunting. Mothers, they always say, go to church with you. That's why I love mothers. Amen? They're more spiritual than most of you hard-headed men out there. But anyway... It's good to have you here. Let's relax and enjoy the Lord. Don't forget, be back this evening at 6 o'clock for our regular, uh, as we'll continue to go through, march through the Scriptures verse by verse. We'll be in, uh, in, in the book of 1 Timothy and uh, in a chronological Bible study in the New Testament. We've completed most of Paul's writings and uh, we'll be completing the pastoral epistles in the next few weeks. And so stay with us and then, of course, be back with us Wednesday evening. I, do, uh, I don't apologize for canceling Secret Church last Friday night. I just felt like the Lord didn't want us to have it. And uh, I, by the way, this is His business. And uh, I just, I, we're supposed to work at His orders. Amen? So that's what we did. We just decided we'd wait and see what He does next time. So 
Don't forget Ladies Bible Study Monday, of course, Monday afternoon at 6.30, and then again at 10 o'clock Tuesday morning. And Sister Connie's been, been giving good reports on how God's working in that. And also, don't forget the Senior Saints meeting will be on my birthday, spiritual birthday, May the 18th. How about that? I'll be, I'll be almost that old. How's that? <laughs> and uh, at least that old. So don't forget that. That's Senior Saints, and that's on the Thursday, May the 18th, 7 o'clock. Be sure to bring a friend and a covered dish. I started to say bring a dish and a covered friend, but it didn't look that way. So just come and enjoy yourself. And uh, we don't have any senior saints around here. Ours are maturing saints. They have not quite matured, and they're still in that process. And uh, be back with us. We're looking forward to a good time as God speaks to our hearts. And by the way, do something for me this morning. Try your best to get whatever is out of your mind that you don't need to think on and try to think on Jesus Christ and Him only because He's the one you're here for. And pray that God will just speak to your heart and encourage you. And uh, let me ask you a question. Is there anybody here this morning that does not need encouragement? Well, that pretty well says it, doesn't it? So let's see if we can keep our hearts and minds on Him and ask God to encourage us. Yes, ma'am. That's the bulletin maker's era. <laughs> Brother Bill did it, but anyway, it's... See, I didn't, or somebody did it. Anyway, it's done. And so just be here that Thursday, and thank you for calling that to our attention. That'll be the 17th. How's that? I, I knew that looked funny for some reason. <laughs> That's what I get for making a point of making it a point, okay? Let's relax and enjoy the Lord. Gentlemen, come and receive the offering, and we'll get right on into the rest of the service, okay? Actually, she's well. She just had a trip that she had to go on this weekend. So, hey, everybody, stand back up. We're gonna sing a few more songs. Lord, I lift your name on high.
remember that other song we've been singing a long time ago? It's called What a Mind of God We Serve. I think it goes like this. Uh, how's it go? How's it go? What a mighty God we serve. That's wrong. That's wrong. See, here, here's the thing. When you don't sing these songs, that's close. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Well, you know, I tell you, this is fun, ain't it? Well, let's try this. Let's see. Hey, let's skip that song. I need where, where's my we we say we 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 say show me and I trust. Hey, that's close. We say trust me and I'll show you. Hey, that's good. We say change me and I'll praise you. He says praise me. Say, show me, and I'll trust you. He says, trust me, and I'll show you. We say, change me, and I'll praise you. He says, praise me, and I'll change you. Hey, so far we got two out of four. <laughs> hey, let's try one more. I'm, I'm going to finish. Just what he started Even though the water's got to be parted Lift up your head Don't be broken hearted God is going to finish what he started in you He who began a good work in you Is able to do it He who began a good work in you Is able to complete it Now we'll finish it up God is going to finish just what he started, even though the water's got to be parted. Lift up your head, don't be broken hearted, God is going to finish when he started in you. Stop. Lord, thank you, that's over. Well, hold on, let me check the time here. It's the right time. Hey, let's do it one more time. Yeah, come on, preacher. The last, the last one, the God is going to finish song. We did it. Hey, y'all may be seated. Come on down, Clark. Like the preacher said, you never know. You never, never know. 
Put that back. Can you help me move this? No, it's okay. Um, good morning. Um, God wanted me to do this song today. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> so it is all him. It has nothing to do with me. The name of it is called Beautiful Redeemer. And think about it. He redeemed me. He redeemed you from your captivity, from your bondages. We don't live like that a lot, but he redeemed us. And we have to grab him and hang on to him. In Isaiah 43, it says that he has bought me with a price. That he calls me his. I am his. He says, you are mine. And he is not going to leave me when I have to walk through the waters, when I have to walk through the fires, when I have to walk in the valleys. He is with me. He is always there. He is never going to leave me. And my emotions may not feel like he's with me, but he is there. So, um, just this is my song to him. Um, it's, it's all him. It's nothing me at all. So, I just want you to see what he did for you.
Let me ask you a question as we release the kids back to joy celebration. Everyone's ready. Out the door, they've gone. Man, they were already out the door before I got it out of my mouth. I love it. They're excited about going to Children's Church. Oh, we apologize this morning for our musical interlude this morning. It was mostly me and the, and the guitar over there couldn't seem to get it together, and I kept messing Tony up. But uh, he was working under a handicap. I had no talent. That was his <laughs> handicap. So... We're going to be uh, praying harder for our pianist to be back instead of me doing fill-in work, okay? All right, let's take our Bibles. Go with us to the book of James, chapter 1. James, chapter 1. And we're going to be looking at a vitally important part of what God does in our lives as believers. James talks about this diligent battle of faith. Just a few weeks ago, I shared with you uh, the faith war. We're in a battle for our faith. Every day we fight a battle constantly. And by the way, it doesn't take a lot of outside interference. Our flesh is our greatest enemy. And uh, it's not that some of them brag a lot on the devil. I don't believe the devil gets needs any praise. I think our problem is this morning, if we'd be very honest, I have met the enemy and I'm him. And that is our problem, our flesh, that constantly resists the things of God. And so James, in chapter 1, verse 1, let's begin reading just a couple of verses, and then we'll go to the book of Hebrews. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh what? Worketh patience. My goodness, faith being tried produces an element that we need to constantly run this faith race. A runner, and we're going to Hebrews chapter 12, if you'll go with me there, will find that the runner that Hebrews talks about must run the race with what? Patience. Hebrews chapter 12. James said, that when your faith is tried, it produces an element that gives us the ability to run the race that's called the faith race. As many of you know, chapter 11, the book of Hebrews, is that great book of faith, talking about those that have gone before and those who have paid the supreme price and those who did so by trusting God in the face of all adversaries. You know, it's easy to talk about faith. It's even easy to have faith unless you need it. And it seems like in the most difficult times of our life, that's when our faith, we find out just where we stand with our faith. How many of you would readily admit, and you don't need to raise your hands, would readily admit that probably the last couple of years maybe have been some of the most difficult for you and certainly the American Christians uh, that we've ever had to deal with. And here's why. We've never had our faith tried like it's being tried and will be tried now and in the future. This is why this is so vitally important. Hebrews, as the author goes through these chapter 11 and enumerates all the great people that have gone before us, there's a reason that chapter 12 begins in verse 1, begins with this thought, wherefore. When we see the word wherefore or therefore, we need to look back and see what it's there for or why it's wherefore. And the reason is very simple. God's telling you and I something about faith. We hear a great deal about faith today. We hear, you know, people who say, well, you know, use your faith for this and use your faith for that. Well, I want to say something to you. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says faith was given to us to please God. That's the reason we have faith, and it's a gift that God gives to us. It's not something we accumulate. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So faith is built in us, not only as we read the Word of God, but as we experience the Word of God. Have you ever encountered someone who seemed like they were what we call giants of the faith? 
people who have gone through difficult times. And, and ladies and gentlemen, I hate to say this, but I do readily admit that most of us sitting in this building probably don't know a lot about trying of our faith yet. I think that we've experienced some, of course, and are now. I know I shared this morning in our uh, prayer breakfast that I've had more phone calls over the past month and a half or so with people who are dealing with issues that they've never had to deal with before. Things that have just really come face to face with them. And I believe that one of the reasons that we're so taken aback is we've never dealt with them before. We don't know how to deal with some of the issues we're dealing with. So Paul, in his, in his writings, or the author of Hebrews, says this simply, we're going to be running a race. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you something. This is not a sprint. This is not a fast start, fast ending. This is an endurance race. Those that endure to the end... The Bible talks about a great deal. So in chapter 12, verse 1, let's read the first few verses, and then we're going to make some comments about these verses and running this race called the faith race. Wherefore, referring back to chapter 11, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, the witnesses that have gone before us, that have left the trail of blood and tears, and all of that was left by faith. Those that trusted God when they couldn't see anywhere else to go. When they didn't know what the next moment was bringing. You see, it's easy to trust God when we already know what's happening. But to face the unseen and some of the things that we're facing now are things we've never seen before. How do we deal with them? He said, seeing we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside... Every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against yourself or himself, lest you be wearied and faint. Where? In your minds. You see, the enemy knows that if he can get inside your mind, he's got your race. If he can get inside the, the runner's mind, if weariness can get inside the runner's mind, then there's no way he'll finish He'll believe. He'll begin to agree with the feeling that he has. I just can't make it. I can't make it any further. I don't know what I'm going to do. Listen to me carefully. This is why this is so important. Our race isn't over yet, folks. We're in the middle of it. We're in the middle of running this race that that Paul talks about. And I need to warn you. You have all kind of blockades on this race. I I can think of of probably a dozen or so that right off the top of my head, let me tell you that one of your greatest enemy is your physical body. How many know that this body demands certain things? It says, I'm tired. It says, I'm weary. It says, I'm thirsty. It says, I'm hungry. It says, I want to do this. And by the way, if you listen to your body, you will never finish the race. The mind will stop you. Your mind, by the way, you do know that the body follows the mind. Whatever you put in your mind, that's what your body is going to respond to. If you begin to think in your mind, oh, this is just too much, I can't deal with this, you are just whipped yourself. You just caused yourself to stop the race. You're saying, you know what, I'm, I'm so tired, I've, I've, just, I've gone as far as I can go. I've got to have a place to sit down and rest Let me tell you, you never sit down and rest. You sit down to stop. And the race has got to be continued. Why? Life is still moving. As long as we're breathing, we're intended to run the race. Look at a couple of things inside the text. The first thing that he says, if we're going to run this race, we must remember that we're running it behind those who have gone before 
You see, one of the things that I'm convinced of is God would never let you do something that I can't do. God will never give you the strength to keep running and not give me the strength to do the same. So it's important for you and I, we look at some of the heroes of the faith. We look at men like David. We look at men like John, Peter, James, and Paul. We look at them and think, oh, well, wait a minute. You know, they were, they were different people. No, no, no. They breathe just like you and I breathe. The only difference between us and them is a thing called faith. Trusting God in the middle of adversity. He said, seeing that we are encompassed about by such a great cloud of witnesses, look at those that have gone before. Don't stop. And one of the things that I found out in this life, if you begin to think, someone told me the other day, he said, how old do you think you are? I'm glad I didn't have to answer that immediately. I had time to think about it. And then before they gave me a chance to really answer, they said, Somebody told me you're just as old as you feel. I thought, oh God, I hope not. (laughs) Sometimes the body rebels and it begins to tell you things that is not true. Here's why. I know as long as I have breath, there's hope. As long as I have hope, there's an opportunity for faith to continue to move. And if you let anything or anyone get in your mind... That's the weight you need to lay aside first. Listen to me. I'm amazed at how easy it is for the enemy to plant things in our hearts and our minds. Here's, by the way, he has plenty of help. Have you ever noticed some of the people you're around? Well, start noticing. Because many that are you're around are more negative than the opposite side of a battery that says positive. They're negative. I mean, some of them wouldn't be happy if they were hung with a new rope. It just absolutely nothing could happen to make them happy. Everything is doom and gloom. Everything is bad and sad. There's no such thing. Listen to me carefully. As long as there's life, there's hope. And as long as God's alive, faith is still alive. Amen? It's not over with. Look at looking at a dead end street. Some people treat life like that. It's a dead-end street. I'm just going down this road and woe is me. Listen to me carefully and I say it again. The faith that these people had that ran the race before us, they were no different than you and I. They had, they have this, uh, this cereal problem in the morning, you know, snap, crackle, pop, that kind of stuff. They, they had all the aged, uh, thing. And listen to me, it really hurts me when I hear people say, I'm just ready to give up. Don't do that. You know why? You're still a possibility. You are still a possibility. You're still breathing. There's something God has for you. And the only reason that you want to give up is your mind keeps telling you to quit. I got news for you. Send a message. Tell your mind to quit. Tell your mind that it's not in charge. This book will regenerate your mind. If you'll allow it in. And that's why the author said, look at the witnesses that have run this race before us. They're not anything special. They just had a special God. That's what we have. We have a special God. I remember speaking with a gentleman that had just been sentenced to death row. And I thought, how how am I going to talk with this guy? I mean, what am I going to tell him? You know, Am I going to be one of these God's Mr. Fix-It man? He's going to fix your life? Well, I don't think so. So I said, listen, you know what? I, I've never had a life sentence. I don't know what you're dealing with. But I can tell you this. This man professed to be a Christian that he'd given his life to Christ since he'd been arrested, did all that he did. And here's what he said. He said, <clears throat> I wish you could trade places with me so you could understand that all I can see is a black tunnel. And people will tell me that there's a light at the end of the tunnel, but I believe that light is a freight train coming at me. You see, when there's no hope, what do you tell a person with no hope? The only thing that I can tell him, and the thing that God used to encourage his life just a little bit, was this. 
If it's a train coming at you, there's a God between you and that train. And you can be whatever you want to be with whatever God gives you to live with. I don't know what your circumstances are sitting in this room this morning. But I do know this. I know that God's not through with you yet because you're here. God still has something for you. I don't know how difficult life has become. But I know that it can't be any more difficult than those who have already run the race before us. Those that have gone through all kinds of difficulties. And the reason they did is because of the faith that God gave them to keep going. You know what? I think we need some more cheerleaders for Jesus. What do you think? I think we need more cheerleaders for Jesus. And by the way, I want to recommend quickly that you turn off some of the talking heads on the TV. They're enough to make you want to go commit hogicide. I mean, they're telling you all these bad things. Listen, I know that I know that there's things that are happening, and I'm well enough aware that these things are just part of God's plan. Do you understand that God hadn't lost control? Things are going exactly. It may not be going. You know what the problem is? I just figured it out. They're going the way God wants them and not the way we want them, and we're going to stick out our lip. I don't believe it's going to bother God a bit how you react. Do you? The thing that is so important is learning that the race must go on. You cannot afford to quit. You know why? People are watching you. You know what the sad part is? They base who Jesus is on us who profess that He's our Lord. They watch them and say, Oh, well, they're Christians and looking at them. Look at them. I mean, they're, why do I want to go join up with somebody who, who uh, they're, all they're doing is moaning and groaning and, and griping and complaining and nothing ain't ever right and they don't ever have enough and if they got enough, they don't do it in the right. Uh, this, you can find something in everything to be glad for. Amen. Something in everything. Here's something to be glad for. Your God is not dead. Amen. Muhammad is dead. Buddha's dead. Can I go on and on? The only God that's still alive is the only one that ever was alive, and His name is Jesus Christ. Say amen. He's your Lord. Don't you dare put a marker on His grave, R.I.P. Rest in peace, my word. He's not going to rest, and He is peace. He don't just rest in it. So He said, run the race because others have run it before. I was thinking of a dear brother of mine that's in heaven this morning, Gene Neal. Gene was a brilliant man. He had everything going for him. He was born uh, with a lot of money in his family. And Gene was a, he had a, he had a dual doctorate in law. Very seldom do you find PhDs, two, in the, in law. He was a very, very wealthy, very, uh, Intelligent man, very sinful man, became a prosecuting attorney in the state of Florida in Dade County. Really got all the connections. You do know that law has more to do with connections than how good you are with the law. It's how many judges you have at your house. And Gene got all the connections going and all of a sudden decided that he wanted to go into criminal law. That's where the money was. It's not in prosecution. So Gene went into criminal law. He began to be the go-to man for the mafia. And Gene began to have all this money coming in. And, and a lot of times his, his, uh, his pay would be big amounts of drugs. And then, of course, he'd swap off the drugs. And um, So he got involved. He got... He got so enamored with himself that he, he convinced himself that he could, could, he could actually commit the perfect crime and not get caught. You see, one problem with pride, it makes you stupid. And he thought, sure, I can do this thing. He planned this big bank robbery. And he got all these connections made. And by the way, he pulled it off. Everything went fine. He even stored the money in his attic in his office, along with submachine guns and plastic explosives and cocaine. 
And one day this guy came to him and said, look, you know, I've heard so much about you. I, I want to use you and all this stuff. And of course, he played, he played right where most people know. If I want to get you, all i got to do is brag on you a little bit and I got you. Because almost every human being wants to think more of themselves than they really are. And so they got, he got Gene. And of course, come to find out he was a secret service man. Trapped him. Took him to the federal magistrate. Sentenced him to on 25 felony charges. The first one, they gave him 25 years and said, I'll come back to see you after this. you do this one. We'll see about the other 49 counts. I'm trying to tell you something. That you can try to run this race as a human being without God. That's a dead end street. No matter how much you get. No matter what you got. Your day is coming. His day came. He was sitting in Springfield. Under the ground. Where all federal prisoners go. And there. In a jail cell. This atheist who attended a church most of his life, but he was an atheist because his money was power. His, his God was power and money and prestige. But there he sat naked in a jail cell underground with a 25-year sentence with another 49 counts to go. Oh, there's no hope. Yeah, there was a hope. He cried out to Jesus Christ. <laughs> you see, the man who never thought God was big enough to demand his life now finds himself at the end of himself. And God heard him. How do you think God would hear somebody like that? God heard him. Jesus Christ came through all of the cement, all of the steel bars, and rescued a perverted soul and gave him a race to run. Gene Neal, for the next 45 years, oh, by the way, Gene Neal was my cellmate. In prison, and one of my best friends, a man that loved Jesus probably as much as any man I'd ever met, because he spent the next 45 years preaching to inmates in every, in every continent in the United in the world except two. He preached to more inmates the preciousness of Jesus Christ until this past year. I still ain't forgave him. He ran off and left me. He went home to be with this Jesus that he loved so much. And I saw him just before he went home to be with the Lord. I went down to see him. Gene, now an old man, 80 years old, drawn over in severe pain. He lived the last three or four years of his life in constant pain. And the last time I saw him, I said, Gene... What do you account all this pain that you're having to suffer? How do you feel about this when you talk to God? He said, you know, I thank Him for it. And here's why. As long as I can feel the pain, my race is not over. <laughs> as long as I can feel the pain, my race is not over. He said, there's nothing that God can't do with anyone who will give them as much of their life as they give themselves. As much as we give ourselves, if we give Him that much of our life, we can run the race. Run it because other people have run it. And also, look at the next verse. He said, not only, or the next part of that verse, He said, let us lay aside every weight. Every weight, the things that get in our way in running this life for Jesus. And by the way, I don't know the things that get in your way, but I know some things that can get in mine. 
And I know that if I've got myself all covered up with them and I'm cumbered down with all these thoughts, and by the way, the weights here I believe he's talking about are not just physical weights. I believe most of them are mental weights. We have our own idea of what we want to be for God. We want to do this for God. Have you ever asked God what He wanted to do? That's our biggest enemy. What we want. What our plans are. And Paul said, you've got to lay them aside. You can't run this race with all of your ideas in God's mind. You've got to put them aside. Why? You've got a race that has a finish line. And at the finish line, there's a man named Jesus with his arms wide open saying, Come on. He's your encourager. Look at... Look at this. He said, not only the weight, but you need to lay the sin which is so easily beset us. And that's a singular. You see the word? It didn't say sins. Every one of us has a particular sin, I believe, that nags us and drags us and pulls us back physically. And I don't know, again, I don't know what yours is, but I know what mine is. And the one thing I know, I can't run the race with my mind on my sin. You know what? I'm going to be chasing the sin instead of Him. Now, y'all don't lie. This is Sunday morning church. Let's get down to business. Amen? I don't know. But I know this. The race is still running. we got to keep running. Why? It's not over yet. He had not called us home yet. It's still going. He said, and run it with patience. Whew. Patience in American Christians? We're one of those that prays like this. God, I need patience and I want it right now. <laughs> That's why we got 7-Eleven stores on every corner. Amen? We're patient people. Lord, help us. I was watching a TV commercial the other day talking about this new TV. He said, I like it because there's no drag between changing channels. Do what? <laughs> it takes all of three seconds for them to get over there. I like it because it's fast. Richard Petty syndrome. <laughs> run with patience the race that is set before us. Here's the way to run it. Look with me at verse 2. Looking. <laughs> not the inference there is not just having a gaze staring at a, at, a, at a statue or something. It says the word looking doesn't even infer a physical look. It means literally this, placing all you are in Jesus' hand. Looking unto Jesus. For what? For strength to keep running. For clarity of mind. For laying aside the weight. For getting our priorities straight and never, never, never letting it take our mind anywhere else. The enemy knows how to get you. You know that? Boy, he knows exactly where you live. You know why? We tell him. We constantly tell him what. And he, by the way, you do know that the devil's not smart enough to read your mind. You do know that, don't you? you got to tell him or show him what your weakness is or he don't know it. I found out something. I don't think he knows how to spell, so I spell some of mine. <laughs> hey, I'd rather do that than just blab it out. Amen? And knowing that he does this, he'll pick up the closest thing to you and hit you with it. Usually it's your family. I mean, I love family, and God ordained family. But I want to tell you, they're the greatest blessing in the world, but they can be the most heartbreaking, difficult circumstance, and the devil will slap you in the face with your family because he knows he can stop you. He'll do it. I know that. And by the way, I don't just look around and say, yeah, he's used all these people. He's used you too, hotshot. You're part of family also. There's been a time in our life but he said, we need to, to make sure that we look unto him. Why? Because he's the one that started this. He's the one that's going to finish this and do it like he did. Whew. Do it like he did. How did he do it? For the joy that was set before him. He endured 
running the race is an endurance thing. You're going to have to put up with some things that are not so fine. You're going to have to deal with issues. There's going to be all kind of roadblocks. There's people, uh, money problems will stop you. On, I know people that have just uh, had a lady tell me about two or three weeks ago. She called me and she said, I've been praying and I've been praying and I've been praying and God hadn't answered my prayer. I quit on God. And I thought, boy, I bet that just upset God terribly. Why do we think that God has to respond to everything we say just to keep us going? If we don't keep going in spite of everything, that's what He did. He said He endured the what? The cross. Despising the shame. And now, guess what? He's got a permanent seat at the right hand of the Father. Woo! I think that's a pretty good blessing for crossing the finish line. Last thing. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of God. Verse 3. End of subject. Considering Him. The word consider means to weigh so as to judge the value of. Here's what I found out. Most American Christians... Run for what's most valuable to them. I don't know what that is for you. What's most valuable to you? Weigh Him. Put Him on a scale of everything else it is that you want in life. And figure which one tilts the scales. That's the one you're going to be holding on to. Whatever it is. Or whoever it is. That's why it says, consider Him. That endured such contradiction of sinners against Himself. Lest you be wearied and quit up here. And if you quit up here, you're going to quit down here. If your mind quits, your race is finished. And he said, let us run the race. There's something at the end of the finish line. Oh, it's not heaven. Heaven was won at the cross. We're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. We don't run to get to heaven. You know what we run for? We run to get a crown. A crown. A prize. Someone said, well, what in the world am I going to do with a crown in heaven? I'm so glad you asked that. You're going to lay it at His feet. You see, that's what makes running the race worthwhile. You know, I can't, I can't do anything for Him Except what He did for me. He gave me His life. I want to give Him mine. Not just part of it. All of it. That's how. That's how. If your mind is made up. My daddy had a saying. He was a real wise man. I didn't realize that till he'd gone home to be with the Lord. He said something like this. My daddy was an old country farmer. Y'all couldn't tell I was country, could you? He had the saying. He didn't get saved till he was in his 60s. I had the privilege of winning him to the Lord in 60, 64, 65 years old. And he told me one day, he said, You know what? I, I want some of that bulldog religion. I said, Daddy, what are you talking about? He said, You know what bulldogs, you know, if a bulldog gets a hold of something, he ain't going to turn loose. I thought, Man. I need to preach that. We need some bulldog religion. Something that will get a hold of us and us get a hold of it and won't give up till we get home. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Heads bowed, eyes closed. The faith race. If you're here this morning and you'd say, Pastor... I've never started the race. I don't know Jesus as my Lord. If I died right now, I don't have any assurance I'd go to heaven. I'm standing looking into the face of God wondering about the condemnation of hell. And if you've never given your life to Christ this morning, I want to invite you right now to listen to the pleading of the Spirit of God as He deals with your heart. 
And if you'd love to this morning right now, why don't you just lift your hand up and say, Pastor, I've never given my life to Christ, but this morning I want to give it all. I don't want to hold anything back. I want to give it all. Would you pray for me? Would you slip your hand up? Hold it up just for a minute and slip it right back down. Amen. God bless you. Anyone else just before we leave? Then maybe as believers sitting in this room this morning, you've been running the race, but you had not been doing too good a job. You've been kind of faltering. You've had your mind has been on everything else except running the race. And if you'll be honest and you'll pray along with me that I want to run the race so that my Lord won't be ashamed when I step through heaven's door, He'll say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. If you want to run the race that way, would you slip your hand up in the air all over the building? God sees your hands. Thank you for your honesty, for your desire. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, you see the hearts of your people. And Lord, the race is not over till you call us home. And I pray, God, that these that slipped their hands up, and even those that didn't this morning, that you deal with their heart and encourage their life and help them see that one day we'll be able to say, it was worth it all. It was worth it all. Thank you for your love and in your mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Would you look at me just before we leave? Two things I want you to do. I want you to know it's kind of hard to run the race sitting down. Get up and let's go home. 